Hello, my name is Roisin and this is my May TBR. Hello friends and welcome back to my channel. So today we are in my conservatory to talk about my May TBR because it is now reached that point in the year where it is light enough for me to film after work but only if I sit in a room entirely made of windows. So I have 12 books on my TBR this month which I don't think is actually too much, seems like a reasonable amount for me to get through and some of them are fairly short so I am feeling optimistic this month that I will make it. This month is also my first month of doing my reading around the world, reading the regions challenge, which if you don't know what that is, I will leave a video in the cards above. But essentially, I am trying to read from more different countries around the world. So every other month, I'm going to be pulling a region out of a jar that I have made. And then I'm going to pick books for that and make a reading vlog of it. Hello. So it is quite early on in April. It is the 10th of April today, but I am going to film me picking my region for May's challenge where I read the regions. I'm going to film it today because I have to order everything through the library or at least some of the books I'll probably have to order through the library and with everything being so up in the air at the moment reserves take longer than normal. So it's best to get ahead so I'm just going to pick my region now and then you can get back to my TBR. It's exciting it's the first one I hope it's a, a good one. Oh my god I cannot even. Southern Africa is what that says but um, there must have been some water got in my jar because um i won't focus on anything but my face for that there you go that's what that looks like i'm pretty sure that says southern africa but um <laughs> i also think i'm going to have to rewrite my regions anyway so i will be reading from southern africa in may so i will let you get back to my tbr and see which books i've chosen for that this could kind of work as like a two month reading challenge if you wanted it to like i announced at the beginning of this month what this two months region is southern africa and you let, let me know in the comments if you're joining in and as i mentioned in my reading the regions video i said if you wanted access to my spreadsheet i would try and make that available for you what i've decided to do is to give you a spreadsheet page for the current um, region that I'm reading because that was the one that I had the most like complete research for because I did extra research after I picked it out which means there is a google sheets link in the description and if you click on that it will go through to a landing page for the reading the regions generally and then the second sheet will be as many books as I could discover that have been translated into English from the current region and I will add a new page each time I do a different region so with all the housekeeping out of the way um let's get into it i think i should probably start with the books that i am planning to read for the reading the regions challenge so i've got six books here and then two other books that i want to talk to you about normally for my reading challenges i pick five books but doing this research i found so many interesting books so i've ended up with a huge pile but i am allowing myself to dnf if i don't get on with anything because eight is a lot when i was reading seven books for reading the historical fiction around the world it ended up being an hour-long vlog so um <laughs> makes me less inclined to try and read all of these books anyway the first one here is this is house of stone by navuo rosa tashuma so this is kind of historical fiction about um rhodesia and modern zimbabwe um that's the country that it covers for southern africa bukowski has gone missing his father abed and his mother agnes cling to the hope that he has run away rather than been murdered by the government thugs but only the lodger seems to have any idea zamani has lived in the spare room for years now quiet polite well read and well healed he's almost part of the family but almost isn't quite good enough for zamani cajoling coaxing and coercing abed and agnes into revealing their sometimes tender often brutal life stories zamani helps to aims to steep himself in borrowed family history so that he can fully inherit and inhabit its uncertain future spanning 50 tumultuous years in southern africa so excited to read that i know very little about rhodesia apart from that it is one of the darkest periods in the british imperial um history which is full of very dark periods so um i think this is going to be quite an emotional read um but it sounds really good and it's been um blurbed by no violet bulawayo who is someone that came up a lot for southern african fiction and also garth greenwell who i have never read but i know that matthew sharapa recently posted a video about how he will read anything that garth greenwell has blurbed so he's blurbed this so hopefully it'll be good I'm also planning to read The Old Drift by Namwali Serpel. This is one that I saw in my library a lot and I was really interested in and I think was also quite a lot on Bookstagram. I mean, it does have a really beautiful cover kind of let down by the plastic library cover, um, but it's also been 
It's also been review- uh, blurbed by Garth Greenwell. He gets around. Um, but also Carmen Ma- Maria Mercado, Alice Siebold, and Jennifer Macumbi. So lots of high praise on here from people that I have heard also lots of high praise for. And this one is set in Zambia. On the banks of the Zambezi River, a few miles from the majestic Victoria Falls, there was once a colonial settlement called the Old Dread. Here begins the epic story of a small African nation, told by mysterious swarm-like chorus that calls itself man's greatest nemesis. The tale, a playful panorama of history, fairy tale, romance, and science fiction, which sounds so good. Um, In 1904, in a smoky room in the hotel across the river, an old drifter named Percy M. Clark, foggy with fever, makes a mistake that entangles his fate with those of an Italian hotelier and an African busboy. This sets off a cycle of unwitting retribution between three Zambian families, black, white, brown, as they collide and converge over the course of the century into the present and beyond which so epic family saga kind of a situation here from 1904 also again british colonial history it's going to cover a lot of ground um so excited to get to this one too although it's hefty then i have a classic and this is a south african classic called cry the beloved country by alan Patton. um in fact one of the women that i work with lived in south africa for a while and uh, when she was a child and studied this in school um in the city of johannesburg a father seeks a delinquent son His search takes him through a labyrinth of murder, prostitution, racial hatred, and ultimately reconciliation. First published in 1948, Cry the Beloved Country addresses the problems of race relations with the scrupulousness of the historian, the sensitivity of the poet, and stands as the single most important novel in 20th century South African literature. It's nice and short. I have talked before how how I have some trouble with um, mid-century classics a lot of the time, but hopefully this one doesn't fall into that trap. Um, then I also have What We Lose. This one is also South African. And this is about Thandi, a black woman, but often mistaken for Hispanic or Asian. She is American, but doesn't feel as American as some of her friends. She is South African, but doesn't belong in South Africa either. Her mother is dying. This one um, like, looks like a standard novel in terms of size, but is actually written quite like in little vignettes. Some of the chapters are only one line long. There are pictures throughout this. So I'm interested by the kind of experimental nature of the writing in this one. Then we have um, Nervous Conditions by Tsitsi Dangaremga. Tsitsi Dangaremga was shortlisted for the Booker Prize last year with the third book in this trilogy, um, This Mournable Body. Uh, but this is the first book about the same characters. And this one's been blurred by Madeleine Tien. And I love Do Not Say We Have Nothing. Uh, this is another piece of historical fiction. And this one is set in Zimbabwe, the same as um, The House of Stone. Two decades before Zimbabwe would win independence and end white minority rule, 13-year-old Tambudzai Zigwake embarks on her education. On her shoulders rest the economic hopes of her parents, siblings and extended family, and within her burns the desire for independence. Uh, A timeless coming of age novel and a powerful exploration of cultural imperialism. I quite enjoy a coming of age novel, particularly with the kind of historical aspect that this has, um, although I think it's kind of autofiction almost. Um, I think it is very closely based on Tsitsi Dangaremga's experience. Um, but it's also been blown by Chinua Achebe, which is good praise. Um, so very excited to get into that one, although I did struggle with this mournable body last year, but it was during a time when I was struggling with li- more literary fiction anyway. Um, so hopefully I'll feel more capable of reading this one now. And then we also have the Strange Square book, <laughs> the, the First Wife, A Tale of Polygamy by Paula. This is a surname I'm unsure how to pronounce, and I did look it up but couldn't find anyone like pronouncing it out loud. So I would say it Chitsiane, but I'm not sure that's how you're actually supposed to say it. Um, and this one's been blurred by Marza Stay. So lots of good blurbs in this selection of books. I suppose um, the way that it, oh, I feel, this is a feeling that I have and not anything that I have any ed- evidence to back up, that when books from not England and America make it to England and America they have they are like the best of their type like because otherwise they wouldn't break out of their country because but because of like American cultural hegemony and Anglophone cultural hegemony English and American books don't have to be at that peak obviously I'm within England so um it's a bit different because I don't know if this is true it's just a tangent anyway after 20 years of marriage Rami discovers that her husband has been living a double or rather quintuple life Tony, a senior police officer in Maputo, has been reporting, supporting four other families for many years. Rami remains calm in the face of her husband's duplicity and plots to make an honest man out of him. 
After Tony is forced to marry the four other women according to polygamous custom, the rival lovers join together and to declare their voices and demand their rights. In his feverishly scathing satire on gender politics in Mozambique, Paula Chiziane taps the tensions between tradition and traditional and modern ways, the cultural differences between regions, and the subjection of women in a society where colonial influences still run deep. So, feminist satire and colonial influences, it all sounds right up my street. Though I'm really intrigued to see how easy it is to read a book that is actually square. I'm also planning to read The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind by William Kakwamba. This was made into a documentary which is on Netflix, although it seems to have been taken off of UK Netflix. Um, so I haven't, like I looked for it and it didn't seem to be there, which is disappointing. When William Kakwamba was just 14 years old, his family told him that he must leave school and come home to work on the farm. He could no longer afford his fees. This is the story of how he found a way to make a difference, how he brought light to his family and village and hope to his nation. Malawi is a country battling AIDS, drought and famine, and in 2002, a season of floods, followed by the most severe famine in 50 years, brought it to its knees. Like the majority of the population, William's family were farmers. They were totally reliant on the maize crop. By the end of 2001, after many lean and difficult years, there was no more crop. They were running out of food, had nothing to sell, and had months until they would be able to harvest their crop again. Forced to leave school at 14 years old with no hope of raising the funds to go again, William resorted to borrowing books from the small local library to continue his education. One day, browsing the titles, he picked up a book about energy with a picture of a wind turbine on the front cover. Fascinated by science and electricity, but knowing little more about the technology, William decided to build his own. It is about a boy who was 14 and built a... Um, a wind turbine to bring power to um, a small village in Malawi. And then the final one I have is set in Madagascar um, and is apparently only the second novel from Madagascar to have made it to the UK. And that is Return of the Enchanted Island by Jahari Ravalso. Named after the first man in the creation of the world in Malagasy mythology, Ayetzi Razak was raised to perpetuate his, the glory of his namesake and expected to be as illuminated as his great ancestor. But in the chaos of modernity, his young life is marked only by restlessness, maddening insomnia and an adolescent apathy. When an unexpected tragedy ships him off to boarding school in France, his trip to the big city is no hero's journey. Letzi loses himself in the immediate pleasures of body and mind, weighed down by his privilege and the legacy of his name, Ayetzi struggles to find a foothold. I have the audiobook of this, and but and so as far as I can tell, it is quite a short book. Um, but it has been said to be, um, but it has won prizes and is supposed to be really good. And is also related to mythology of um, the Malagasy people of Madagascar, which I love when mythology is incorporated into books like that. So there you go. Those are all eight of the books that I am currently excited to read for my Southern African uh, exploration through literature. I also have my usual four challenges, trying to read works in translation. Um, there are a few of these in translation. The First Wife is in translation. The Escape to Enchanted Island is also in translation. So um, I don't have to worry about that so much. Um, I also tend to try and read two non-fictions. So The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind is non-fiction, but I'm also going to read Delusions of Gender by Cordelia Fine. Um, and this is one that I have been meaning to read for forever. <laughs> I got this book so long ago. Um, actually, after, I bought Testosterone Rex first because of the beautiful cover. And then I decided I had to read this before I could read Testosterone Rex, which happens all the time. And then I never read this. But I'm planning to read it this month. So fingers crossed. Gender inequalities are increasingly defended by citing hardwired differences between the male and female brain. That's why we're told there are so few women in science, so few men in the laundry room. Different brains are just suited to different things. With sparkling wit and humour, Cordelia finds a text this neurosexism, revealing the mind's remarkable plasticity, the substantial influence of, cul of culture on identity, and the malleability of what we consider to be hardwired difference. So I think this is going to be quite sciencey. Um, I checked it out and like this much of it is notes and references. Um, that's like maybe a sixth of the book. Um, so it's going to be quite sciencey, science heavy. So hopefully I am up for reading that this um, month. Although I have heard p people say that Cordelia Fine is quite accessible and quite a funny writer. So I'm looking forward to that. Then I also tend to try and read a collection of short stories. And this month I'm going to read um, Bombay Stories by Manto. So Manto is an Urdu writer from India and Pakistan. Um, he was f uh, from the state of Punjab, um, which was where the partition happened between India and Pakistan. Um, and so he lived in Bombay for a while, which is where all of these stories are from, but ended up moving to 
uh, Pakistan and most of these stories were written in Lahore um, and so this is a collection of stories about Bombay in the 1940s and Manto was famous for writing about the like low lifes <laughs> the downtrodden people so he writes about like sex workers and pimps um, and so I am interested in reading that um, and that one is both is also a classic and in translation so it covers a lot of my boxes um, I also try and read a classic at the moment because I have another video explaining that 30 classics before I'm 30 which I'll leave in the cards above so I have Manto for that and also Cry Beloved Country the only thing I'm missing is poetry I seem to have run out of poetry to read that I own um, and I couldn't find any southern African poetry that I wanted to add to my list I've also it's already huge and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to include that in the um in the vlog so I feel like I'm a bit behind on poetry as well so I'm going to have to make an extra effort for that in the future but for now I'm just not going to worry about it but there you go those are all 12 of the books I think that I'm planning to read this month let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of them what you think of them and which book you are most excited to hear about are you looking forward to my southern African fiction vlog um please let me know in the comments and if you are going to join in or at least check out my sheets please let me know that too because that would be super exciting uh, thank you for watching please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and to subscribe i put out new videos every wednesday friday and sunday and so i will see you again very very soon bye bye